Church, welcome to Heritage Church Online. I'm so glad that you decided to join us no matter where you're at in the world today. Uh, we've had tens of thousands of people checking us out here on heritagechurch.com and Heritage Church Online uh, from all around the world, 29 different states and nine or 10 different countries. And uh, it's just been a really cool opportunity to connect with you uh, while we're all quarantined and staying home, be able to connect with you right there uh, wherever you're at. So thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, this weekend, uh, we're launching a brand new feature, just like we launched the new website and the new online thing. This week, we're, we're launching a brand new way to get in touch with us and to stay up to date with all the things that are going on here at Heritage Church. Um, and, and here's how you do that. Uh, we'd love to connect you to our, our texting service. And so all you have to do is text the word heritage, heritage to 94,000. The word heritage to 94,000. You do that and uh, you can opt in and we'll be able to stay connected and communicate to one another. I think you're going to be really glad that you did that. We're not going to flood you with a bunch of texts, but it does give you the opportunity to stay in touch, know what's going on. Um, you know, ever since this quarantine started, uh, I've been bringing you the best research that I can find uh, on how to deal with being stuck at home for so long. Uh, so here's a couple things I think would be useful to you. One of you, some of you have really missed out on the whole March Madness thing this year. I mean, we went through the whole month and we didn't have it. So I thought I'd offer the opportunity to get a souvenir NCAA championship t-shirt while they last. Just make that check out to Jeff Forrester and send in the 1999. We'll send you one of those brand new fancy NCAA championship t-shirts. And then uh, you know this, I really care about your career. And so I'm going to give you a little advice. Don't mix up your work from home reality with your binge watching TV on the couch reality. And this has kind of happened to me a few times. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking I'm watching a boring show, like the most boring show I've ever seen, but they keep reminding me I'm actually on a Zoom call. And so uh, make sure that you don't mix those two up or some people might look down on you for it. And then, you know, you've probably heard, and I think this is kind of a cool thing. I know a lot of churches doing this. You've probably heard of a lot of churches doing these drive-in services, which is really cool. We actually even talked about doing that. We just don't have enough parking spaces uh, here on the Heritage Church property to be able to fit you all on the property at the same time. So th that's why we're not doing it. But I did think this church, I think they're promoting a drive-in service, but I think they need a little bit more information because either they're hosting a church service in their parking lot at 6 p.m. or they're challenging Jesus to a fight in the parking lot at 6 p.m. And either way, I got to tell you, I'm going to show up for that one just to see what's going to go, uh, go down there. So I hope that helps give you all the best information I can find on quarantining every time I speak. So we're in this message series called Fearless, Fearless, and we're talking about uh, how God has worked in the lives of great heroes of the faith in the Bible and how he helped these normal people fear less, and, and we look at them as being these incredibly courageous people. And so today we're going to pick up on maybe one of my favorite guys, a guy named Joshua. He's been one of my heroes for years, and, and so we're going to look at him today. General Douglas MacArthur, one of the great generals of World War II, said that Joshua was perhaps the greatest general who ever lived. And the thing I like about him is that this incredibly uh, gifted leader accomplished the impossible in spite of incredible odds and in spite of the incredible opposition that he was facing. His entire life was one big battle, one battle after another battle after another battle. And I think many of you can identify with that, especially right now. It just feels like you're in this constant struggle and difficulty. And yet Joshua never gave up. So I want to give you a little bit of background, especially the background in Joshua chapter 1. Uh, so they're on the verge. 
the people of God, the Israelites, are on the verge of crossing over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. This is what they've been looking forward to for generations. The fact that God had promised them the, the nation of Israel, the land of Palestine, God had promised them the Promised Land, and they were looking forward to it. They were about ready to cross over. Now, they've been in the wilderness for 40 years, and now they come up ready to cross the River Jordan, knowing that they're going to possess the land that God had promised. In, in uh, the 11th verse of the first chapter, God lets them know. I don't think I put it in your notes. But he says, three, di- three days from now, you're going to cross over the River Jordan and go in and take possession of the land the Lord is giving you for your own. God says, I want you to go in there and take possession of it. Joshua, God says, Joshua, you have tremendous future ahead of you. And I'm going to do great things in your life. Everything that I've promised the people of Israel and more. But it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a battle. He says that you're going to have to take possession of what I want to give you. So what's the future going to hold for Joshua? What's the future going to hold for you? The answer is that it's going to hold a mixture. A mixture of all of the amazing blessings and the favor of God on their lives and the fight, the battle necessary to possess the land that God has for them. And God says to you, I have great things that I want to do in your life. I have great things that you haven't even thought of now. I want you to go out and possess it. I want to bless your life. So all of your past is a prologue. All of your best days are ahead of you. But it's going to be a battle. You have to possess your future. So how do you do that? How do you take possession of the blessing that God wants to pour out on your life? How do you really grab a hold of your life? And experience all the things that God has designed for you. Especially in this season when we feel like we're losing a lot of control. We've been kind of under house arrest for the last six or seven weeks. And it's been a difficult thing where we feel like we're losing a lot of our control in life. And then there's this unseen disease that's taking the lives of people that we care about. And and we have this certain amount of fear of whether or not we're going to get it. Or whether we're going to spread it to other people. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. But I can tell you this. God's favor is on you as you choose to put him first. And we'll talk about how God talks about uh, qualifying for his favor in a few moments. But God wants to do something in you. God wants to use you in this new world, in the new way of living. There'll be a battle because there are no victories without a fight. And so he says, I'm going to bless you, but it will be a battle. And so how do you possess your future? How do you take a hold of those things? By doing the same three things that God told Joshua to do in possessing his future. I want to read nine verses. So it's kind of a long passage, but track with me. It's easy to understand. In the first chapter of the book of Joshua, here's what it says. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land that I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. So be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions that Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. And then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I love that passage. As a leader, I love that passage. Sometimes I find myself getting stuck or sometimes I find myself being uncertain about the next step to take Heritage Church or uh, to the, the people that I'm helping lead and, and, and I'm not sure where to go. And oftentimes I'll come back to Joshua chapter one and God is reminding Joshua over and over again that he is gonna keep his promises, that he is gonna deliver on the thing that he promised the people of Israel and that he's going to use this ordinary guy, 
Joshua. Certainly Joshua says, God, I'm not Moses. I'm not this great leader. And over and over again, God tells Joshua, be strong, be courageous, I'm with you. And here's how. He gives him a prescription to succeed. He gives him a prescription to receive the blessing and the favor of God. And I want to unpack those same three things for you today. But first of all, it, when he gives Joshua this instruction to be courageous, I want to talk a little bit about courage. We'll talk about this throughout the whole message today. But here's my definition of courage. It's my personal definition. Courage is the willingness to do what you know is right when it needs to be done regardless of the difficulty or danger. There's lots of different definitions out there, but that's mine. Courage is the willingness to do what you know is right when it needs to be done, regardless of the difficulty or the danger. And so this is what God tells Joshua in verse 9. He says, this is my command. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. And I think for you and for me, we have to remember that God said he told us about all of these heroes of the faith in the Old Testament for our example. That's what he tells us in the New Testament, is that they're here for our example. So when God's talking to Joshua, he's talking to you too. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Maybe that's the only reason you're sitting here watching this service today. Maybe you just needed to be reminded or maybe here for the first time from God. He's calling you to be courageous. He's calling you to be strong for those around you and that God is with you wherever you go. So here's a few observations about courage, uh, two any, actually. The first one is this. Courage grows in us as we do the things which require it. Courage grows in us as we do the things that require it. Uh, here's what he tells Joshua in verse six. Be strong and courageous for you are the one who will lead these people. So you don't muster up the courage and then go about what God told you to do. Instead, God gives you courage as you go and do what he told you to do. Does that make sense? So I don't wait for the courage to go and obey God. Instead, I obey God and he gives me the courage. So it's about the going. He, in this one, he says, you're gonna go lead the people and I'm gonna make you strong and courageous. So courage grows in us as we do the things which require it. And, and here's just a side note. This is a parenthetical. Joshua was just simply the conduit through which God chose to bless his people. God was going to bless the people of Israel. They had waited for 40 years to cross into the, the promised land, and God had determined now is the time. And God looked for a leader and said, Joshua, I feel like you're ready. You're the one I'm going to use. So it wasn't on Joshua to be able to finally lead the people into Israel. It was God doing it and using Joshua. It was God keeping his promises, not Joshua keeping Joshua's promises. So Joshua was just a tool. He was uh, an asset for God to use. And so he says, be strong and courageous for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land that I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. So God's saying, I'm keeping my promise, Joshua. You're just the conduit of my blessing to others. If you're available and you're willing to go with me, I want to use you. So Joshua was simply the tool that God had decided to bless his people. So just be willing. That's what I'm trying to say here. Be willing to be the tool that God uses to bless your family. Be willing to be the tool that God uses to bless your coworkers or to bless your neighbors. Because it's not about you. It's not about whether or not you qualify or whether or not you can deliver on God's promises. Instead, it's about what God is wanting to do for them through you. And so the requirement for you would be to be willing and to be available to be used by God. So the first observation then is simply courage grows in us as we do the things which require it. Not that we wait for courage. We do those things and God gives us the courage. And then the second observation is this, that God comes when we trust, or courage comes, I'm sorry, courage comes when we trust that God is with us when we go with him. So courage really is enhanced. Courage really begins to flood our lives when we be, begin to trust that God is with us while we go with him. This is why he says, this is my command, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The reason why he was able to tell him, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged, is because God was with him. He didn't have to worry when God was with him. He'd have to worry maybe if he's on his own, but when he knows that God's with him, who could possibly be against him. I, I love this. King David, a number of years after Joshua, writes this with the same kind of spirit, a great warrior 
who says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. King David is saying, there's nowhere I can go to get away from your favor, get away from your presence. Paul, later on in the New Testament in the book of Romans, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, which is a great passage for you to read. If, you, if you're looking for a good passage to read, Romans chapter 8 right now would be a good one for you. To, that's where it talks about God works all things together for our good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So many other things. But in Romans eight thirty one, he says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these that God loves us? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? If I got God on my side, what do I have to worry about? So I want to give you three fearless steps to possess your future, to really take a hold of the future that God has for you. So uh, yes, we have God on our side. Yes, we have uh, God has given you a brain and he expects you to use it. And so, of course, we put on our seatbelt when we drive our car and we sanitize our hands after we've been out in public and we wear a mask if we need to and social distancing, all those kinds of things. But at the same time, God did not call us to be fearful people. God has said, follow me, I'm with you and I will protect you and I will care for you. So here's three steps, three fearless steps to possess your future. So in Joshua chapter one, God's given Joshua a pep talk and he says, I know you're about to be in battles for the next 20 years or so and so I want to encourage you. I want you to do these three things and these three things will sustain you through these battles and through these struggles and these difficulties. If you do these three things, it'll make an impact in your life and you'll be able to make a difference. Twice in this one chapter, Joshua chapter one, the word success is used. And God says, listen, if you'll do these three things, I'll guarantee success in your life. It's God's strategy for success. And it's his strategy for possessing the future. They're simple, but I think they're very profound. These are incredibly simple. You, you probably can already fill in the blanks and guess what we're going to say. But the concepts being simple does not make them uh, ineffective, right, or ineffective. Uh, they're very profound. So the first one is this. you got to set up a plan. You just have to make a plan. There's going to be a day when you're allowed to come out of quarantine. There's going to be a day when you're trying to seize your future in your career with your finances or in relationships. But you have to have a plan. God says you got a plan for the future. God plans. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about how God has a plan for your life. And if you're going to be like God, if you're going to be more and more like Jesus, you've got to learn how to plan too. You need a plan for your future. Because if... You need to plan for your future because that's where you're going to spend the rest of your life is in the future. And so if you don't plan for it, if you don't make a plan for your future, somebody else will. So God comes to Joshua and he says, listen, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River. And I'll give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. God says, get ready for the future. Get, prepare for the future. You have to prepare to possess what God has promised in your life. So what was Joshua's response? Joshua says in verse 11, Joshua ordered the people, get your supplies ready. Joshua believed God, and God says prepare, and so he began to prepare. Right now, you've been kind of suspended in your homes and, and not quite maybe as busy as normal. Right now is a great opportunity to read a few books or to track along with some online training or something to continue to prepare for your future, to begin to make plans to possess your future, not to just have it happen to you, but for you to grab a hold of it. And God says, get ready. And Joshua's response was, okay, people, we're going to get ready. The future belongs to the person who prepares for it, the person who has a plan. God says, do you want to be successful? Okay, first get ready, plan, make your life count. Don't go through life unexamined. Look at where you're going and set up a good plan. And notice this, if you would. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Really highlight that. Think about that for a, minute, for a minute, because for many of us, one of the ways that we prepare for the future is we have to let go of the past. Joshua and Moses were very, very close. Joshua had been Moses' right-hand man for nearly all of Moses' ministry. He was almost the vice president at a point. He was the key leader apart from Moses or beside Moses. He'd been his understudy, and now Moses is dead. 
How'd you like to have to replace Moses as a leader to follow up behind him to be act two? I'm sure Joshua had to have felt maybe a little less qualified than he would have liked to been. Certainly had to been a little nervous about that. And yet God said, I have a plan for your life, Joshua. Thank God that Moses did what Moses was supposed to do, but now God had a plan for Joshua's life. Sometimes we let past relationships or past circumstances keep us from possessing our future. It might be a death in our family. It might be a divorce. It might be a, that a friend moves away, or maybe you're still saying, how can I gain the approval of that person in my past? How can I get back to what life used to be like before this, this, this pandemic or whatever? And God says, listen, you got to let go of the past. You have to let go of all those things that were so good in the past, maybe, or so bad in the past. Because if, if, you, ha if you stay in the past, you're never going to live out in the present. You're never going to experience and possess your future. He wants to work in your life and to do great things, but you're never going to possess your future as long as you continue to perpetuate your past. Some of you are still hanging on to relationships and trying to prove yourself to people that you don't need to prove yourself to anymore. So God just has to be pretty blunt with Joshua and says, listen, Moses is dead. It's over. He's buried. Moses was dead, but God wasn't. And this is what God's trying to remind Joshua of. Maybe your old life is gone now. Maybe, maybe life will never be what it used to be. We don't know what the future is going to be. But God's not gone. God's not dead. God still had a plan for Joshua's life. And it went far beyond what Moses had even done. And he says, so you got to let go of those past relationships that have influenced you. Many of them were good, maybe. Many of them maybe were bad, but let's, let's keep going. <laughs> what do you need to bury? Maybe a, a bad failure in the past. Maybe an experience or a hurt, something like that. Let it go. Joshua had to prepare himself and one of those things was understanding the old things are, are gone it's over and there's a new life ahead and God has a plan for your future not just to remember what the past was like in the book of Proverbs talking about these kinds of things planning ahead book of Proverbs chapter 20 verse 18 says don't go charging into battle without a plan don't just go running off and, uh, without having a strategy or a plan also in the book of Proverbs, Solomon tells us a wise man thinks ahead. So the first key, I don't want to over talk this, but the first key on how to possess your future is to set up a plan. Evaluate where you're at, where you want to be, and how to get there. If you were asked to describe in, in, in one sentence your plan for the, the future, for the next year, what would it be? For many people would say, I, I don't have a plan. Maybe others would say, well, I, I, I kind of have a vague plan, a pretty minimal plan or something. Or could you say, maybe, maybe by the end of next week, you could honestly say, I've prayerfully planned and written out some goals. I've got some plans for the remainder of this year in this new reality <coughs> that we're facing. So God says to Joshua, set up a plan. And the second thing God says is to stay in the word. Stay in the word of God. God says to Joshua, you're going to be in the battles for the next 25 years. You're going to be fighting. And you're going to need the Bible as your instruction manual for conflict. It's the manual for the battles of life. <clears throat> so he says this in verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. You see, the books of Moses were pretty much the extent of the Bible that Joshua had at the time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And God says, listen, you take those instructions that Moses gave and you stay with them. He says, do not deviate from them, turning either to the right hand or to the left, and then you'll be successful in everything you do. Really pay attention to don't turn from the right or the left. He's saying don't get sidetracked. Have you noticed how easy it is to get sidetracked today as a Christian, to get off into other things that just aren't as important, that don't really matter or that are trivial? How easy is it to just binge watch for hours and hours and hours on end or to, to go day after day and, and, and just kind of get stuck in this weird rut where you're not really accomplishing any, anything or doing anything? It's really easy to get Sidetracked. I see people who get excited for the Lord and they give their lives to Jesus and they start out great and then they get sidetracked. Sometimes they get sidetracked by bad things, but a lot of times it's good things. 
it's career opportunities or relationships. I've seen so many young men, women and young men get on fire for Jesus and they meet some guy and some girl and suddenly they're willing to compromise so much of what they said they used to believe uh, in order to have that relationship. They're so in love with being in love that they're willing to give up so much of what they know their future to be. Somehow they lose their focus on the word of God. Some of you are going to get sidetracked spiritually during this pandemic or afterward when we start to get back to some semblance of normal. I, I hope not, but I think some will because we didn't stay in the word. So look what he says in verse 8. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to do everything written in it. And only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. So in verses 7 and 8, God promises success twice. God says, don't turn to the right or the left. Stay right on. You keep going. Don't get distracted. Do what I told you to do. Obey. And God says, keep your mind saturated with the word of God. And he says, you'll be successful. The point is this. God's promise of success has absolutely nothing to do with your ability. God's promise for success has absolutely nothing to do with how much you think you can accomplish. God's promise of success in your life has everything to do with your commitment to God's words. It's not your ability, but your commitment to his word that God promises to bring success in your life. So how do you stay in his word? There's three ways. He says, don't let it depart out of your mouth. You need to be talking about the word of God. Meditate on it day and night. You need to be thinking about the word of God. And then be careful to do everything written in it. You have to choose to obey it, to live the word of God. So I want to encourage you to do something. You have all this free time right now where you're isolated a little bit more. So do this. There's a free app. It's the most downloaded Bible app in the world. 300 million downloads or something like that called YouVersion. Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N. YouVersion. Go to your app store, download that. And then in this app, there are different reading plans. So it has the whole Bible, and it can read out loud to you. But there's also a thing if you go, if you click on the button plans, it'll give you some reading plans. There's a really great one by Louis Giglio that's out there right now uh, called Putting an X Through Anxiety. Seven Days Toward Freedom. That's a good one. Charles Stanley has one, that, uh, a really great one called Finding Peace. There's another one <clears throat> put out by the Billy Graham Center that has a 14-day plan to read a little bit in the Bible each day and have some encouragement called I Will Remember. And it's recounting the wonders of God's promises during difficult days. There's another really great one by Brittany Moses called Seven Day Anxiety Detox. You can go on and on. There's all these really great little reading plans. It takes 10, 15 minutes each day, you can set a reminder, and this will help you keep meditating and keep the word of God in your mind and maybe give you something to talk about with your family. But there's tons of topics, not just about anxiety, marriage and men and women issues and finances and business and career and families and all those things. The whole point is to stay in the word, to med meditate on it day and night. <clears throat> Paul tells Timothy this. He says, the whole Bible was given to us to ins by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us to do what is right. And then lastly, if you're tracking along today, we have to step out in faith. I like the word step out because it's faith in action. A lot of people think faith is just something that you believe. But faith is more than just a mental assent. It's more than just knowing. It's an action. It's stepping out and doing what God told you to do. That's when courage comes. God gives you courage when you choose to do what he told you to do. Faith is the application of what you know God would have you do. And you step out in faith. Some people say, I believe in Jesus. And my question would be, so what? So does the devil. Faith means to commit yourself to to take a step towards, to give your life to. You have to step out in faith because faith is an action. And so three times in this passage, there's this phrase, be strong and courageous, in, in verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9. Three times God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Come on, man, are you getting the message? There's going to be a lot of things in your life that are going to distract you, that are going to discourage you, that are going to depress you. But be strong and courageous and step out in faith. 
Let me give you a little bit of background on, on, on where this part is going. The children of Israel have been wandering in the desert for 40 years, and they've had the chance once before to cross over into the promised land 40 years earlier, but they were afraid. They were terrified because they looked into the land, and there were these great, powerful kingdoms that were there that were far more powerful. And so they decided, we're not going to go. There are only two guys that said yes, Joshua and Caleb. So here, 40 years later, they get a second chance. God has allowed that entire generation to die out except for Joshua and Caleb. And now they have another chance. They're standing at the edge of the Jordan River, ready to cross over into the new land, knowing that the moment they cross that river, it's an act of aggression. Knowing that the moment they cross that river, there's these seven other nations that are going to look at that as an act of war. Literally, they're throwing down the gauntlet when they cross the river. The moment they got to the other side of the river, all hell was going to break loose. There would be war, no telling how long it would be. Because on the other side of the river, there were these seven nations, every one of them larger, every one of them stronger than the Israelite nation. Israel didn't even really have an army. They'd been in slavery for 400 years, and they were a bunch of farmers and, and construction workers, along with their wives and their children and their family members. And now they're going to cross the river and enter into who knows how long a period of battle and war. So you've got this great general, Joshua, with no real army, and he's looking at these seven kingdoms that were so much more powerful now you know why God is saying be strong and courageous. You're looking into a life that you can't even hardly see the future. You do know there's some big battles out ahead of you. As a society, we got a bunch of battles coming. Who knows? We, we don't know what's coming next. How are we going to defeat this virus? What is the world going to look like? How do we rebuild our economy? So now you know what God is saying to Joshua. Be strong. Be courageous. Because he says there's things out there that are going to try to tear you down. So what gave Joshua the confidence to go ahead? What gave him the confidence to move ahead? God just simply said, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What gave Joshua the confidence to go ahead? Because God said, don't forget who you're doing this for. You represent the king of kings. You're on assignment from almighty God. Who do you think told you to do this? If I told you to do it, of course I'm going to be with you. That's the incredible thing about being in God's will. When he tells you to do something, he gives you the power to do it. God has never sponsored a flop. And God says, I'm going to be with you, so step out in faith. I do think it's interesting, though. <clears throat> he has to tell him, don't be afraid and don't be discouraged. You know, these are the two enemies that will prevent you from possessing your future. These two things, fear and discouragement. Fear keeps us from getting started. I don't even want to try. I, I could never do that. What if something bad happens if I step out in faith? The other one is discouragement, and it keeps us from continuing. It causes us to give up, and this double whammy hits you, fear and discouragement, and, and they keep you from making your life really count. They keep you from being all that God wants you to be, and the Bible says don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, because I'm with you. That's the bottom line. The thing I like about Joshua is a man of courage. He was also a man of commitment. Courage is not a lack of fear. Courage is moving ahead in spite of your fear. In fact, if you didn't have any fear, then you don't need any courage. I love that. So when God is saying, be courageous, he's recognizing, of course you have fear. That's why you need courage. Courage is when you move ahead in spite of your fear and you witness to that person at work or, or online or you invite somebody to check out the services online or you, you take on that project or that assignment at work or you go after that dream. You do it in spite of your fear. And literally in this story, they had to step out in faith. The Jordan River was flooded. It was, it was very, very, very wide at this point and very, very deep, about 100 feet across, about 20 feet deep. It's rushing water. And this is during the rainy season, so it's flooded beyond its normal banks. And God had told Joshua, listen, I want you to have the, the priests step out. Look what it says. Look at this. Joshua chapter 3. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, 
the water above that point began backing up at a great distance away from, uh, at, at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. It didn't happen while they talked about it. It didn't happen while they all lined up on the shore. It didn't happen while they prepared. It happened when, they, when the first priest's foot touched the water. When the priest touched the water, stepping into the water, God caused the water to back up on one end and flow all the way down to the Dead Sea on the other, and they had dry ground, and they all were able to walk across. It's a beautiful lesson for us. The principle is this. The first step is always the hardest. In anything, the first step in writing a term paper. What's the most difficult sentence? The first sentence. If you play football, the hardest hit is the first hit, right? After, you, after that, you kind of get used to it. If you've ever been a boxer, you know that's true. The first step is always the hardest. Spiritually, the first step is always the hardest. So you take that initial step and you say, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. and I'm going to believe in you. That's the hardest step. And so I want to encourage you today as we wrap up. What's your Jordan River? What's that barrier that's keeping you from the promises of God? What's that barrier that's keeping you from the promised land, from becoming all that God wants you to be? What's that barrier that's holding you back from possessing the life that God has for you? Is it in a relationship? Is it in your career? Something that you're holding on to that you don't want to let go of? What's keeping you in the desert and out of the promised land? So as we wrap up and we come to the close, I just want to encourage you on this. Joshua, at the end of his life, is speaking to the people, and he's reminding them once again what has been at the core of his whole life. In Joshua chapter 24, at the end of this great book, he turns to these people and he says, listen, he's an old man at this point. He's led faithfully for all these years, and he just says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Have you said that somehow in your life? Hey, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to lead my family to serve the Lord. Some people might wash out because they, they never intended to be a man of God or a woman of God. But God says you need to make your choice. The future begins with a commitment. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve other, other gods? Then go after them. But that's not the kind of person I want to be. I'm going to serve my creator. I'm going to serve the God of the universe. That's the kind of person I'm going to be. I'm going to be a person of conviction. Lastly, Joshua chapter 3, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. That means set yourself apart. Get ready. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. God will do amazing things among you. I don't know what tomorrow has, but I'm so excited about the future because God's in control. God's on the other side of tomorrow. God's on the other side of today. God's on the other side of this. God's in the middle of this pandemic. God has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. And God has a plan for you to take more land, to have a, a great future, to possess what God has for you. But you have to consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. So let me ask you, have you given your life to Jesus? The Bible just simply says this. If I'll admit that I'm a, uh, that I'm a sinner, that I'm not perfect, I live my life my own way, and I f I'll believe that Jesus paid the price for me, that he rose again, if I invite him in to be my king, to be my leader, to be my Lord, the Bible says he'll forgive my past, he'll give me confidence in eternity, and he'll give me power for living today. It's that simple. For all of us, God speaks to you and says, be strong and courageous. I have a plan for you. Would you pray with me? So God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for seeing in us what we often don't even see in ourselves. Thank you for empowering us, for giving us courage. During this time, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get afraid. And so God, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us to spend time in the word and help us to have the guts to take the first step. We're going to trust you to take care of us. We're going to trust you for our future. We're going to trust you to take us to your promises. Help us to be lights in the darkness. Help us to be generous with those around us. Help us to find ways to serve our community. Build confidence in you as we walk out, take steps in faith. For those of you who say, Jeff, you know what I need is I, I need to, to choose today. I'm choosing God 
for my life. Pray this prayer. Just say, God, I live my life my own way. I know I'm a sinner. But I believe that Jesus paid the price and he rose again so my sins could be forgiven. So Jesus, today is my day. I open my life to you. Would you come in? Would you be the Lord of my life, the King of my life? Forgive me for my sin. Give me hope and confidence in eternity. and Give me power and strength for living every day of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, I just want to encourage you. We've had so many people let us know. I prayed that prayer, Jeff. Today's the day I'm choosing me and my household, that we're going to serve the Lord. Today's the day I crossed that line of faith. I accepted Christ. If, if that's what you did, there's a button right there on our website that says uh, accept Jesus. And uh, that's what I want you to do. Click that button. Let me know. I, I want to help you. I'll send you some free resources, no strings attached. But I can't help you take these next steps of faith if you don't let me know. So you began this journey. Now let us help you grow strong and be courageous and let us help you take your next spiritual steps. So let us know on that. And then for the rest of you, uh, make sure that you continue to engage, engage with the children's ministry things at HC Kids TV on YouTube and the youth uh, uh, stuff that's on YouTube and, and the prayer warriors that are on our Facebook pages and all those things. We love you. We miss being together, but we're so glad that we get to spend a little bit of time in your living room each day. We look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless you and God bless your family. We'll see you next weekend.